This is a program from the Wapaka Area Public Library. Please put your hands together and welcome Laura. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. And thank you to everybody in the audience who are veterans. Can, can everybody just have all the veterans stand up, please? So I'm not the only one standing. <laughs> Thank you. So when I got home from Iraq in 2004, I started, restarted my junior year of college at UW-Madison. And I could not relate to the people sitting right next to me or in front of me or behind me. They were worried about what party they're going to go to on Friday night or what to wear or who to date or what material possession they want. And I felt lost. I didn't feel like we connected at any sort of level. And so I decided to put a presentation together to show the kinesiology department at UW-Madison. And in 2004, with 80 audience members, that's how this all got started. <laughs> uh, when I was deployed, I journaled every day. And if I forgot a day, hey, uh, Mr. Flayton, there's a seat right here if you want one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I journaled every day, and sometimes I joked with myself about writing a book, and sometimes I thought, no, this is really going to happen, but I never actually thought it was going to come to fruition. And the act of actually holding on to something like this almost brings me to tears. And so I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to share this story with you. It's not about making the big bucks. It's not about becoming famous. It's truly just about spreading awareness. And, and, and the experience that I had, that varies differently from every single soldier that goes overseas. So even somebody in my own squad will tell you that that's not what their deployment was like. All right, so shall we get into it? <laughs> so this is an Apache helicopter, and these are the cross swords from um, Saddam Hussein's regime. In fact, the hands holding the swords are, Saddam, are replicas of Saddam Hussein's hands. There are little helmets all across, not little helmets, regular helmets, all across the ground. And those are helmets from the Iraq-Iran war. All the Iranians that the Iraqis killed, they took their helmets, took them back, put them on the parade ground so they could march over the Iranians' helmets whenever they marched. So that's the story of the cross swords. They are now torn down. So it's not every day you have weapons at your disposal, so I decided to take some glamour shots when I had the opportunity. <laughs> I have my, um, my uh, rifles right there, my M16s. This one um, is mine, and I named it Xena, the warrior princess. I have two pistols here. Those are um, 9 millimeter Berettas. And then that's an automatic machine gun with live ammo hanging around my, net, my neck. And I am standing in front of a fan, so my hair will blow back. <laughs> All right, so I joined the Army National Guard in March of 2001. What happened six months later? September 11th. So when I signed up, one of my best friends, in fact, her mother is sitting right here, <laughs> said to me, do it. What's going to happen in the next six years? And then six months later, September 11th hit. And for those of you that have read my book, you understand how devastating that was to my family. Because I had an older brother who was a medic in the regular army as well. And I have a twin brother. And my twin brother called me up that day. And he was crying because he was afraid his brother and sister would go to war at the same time. And I assured him that would never happen. And then two years later, it did. Um, all right, so again, I joined the Army National Guard as a military police officer. I wanted to be as close to the front lines as a woman could get. <laughs> and that's what I did. And then I was done in 07. We were deployed from March, 2000 and uh, March 2003 until July 2004. Um, I also want to mention that my own father was a military police officer during the Vietnam War. So that helped motivate me to join the military police. <clears throat> All right. For those of you that don't know, because I sure as heck didn't when I joined for the military breakdown, there's three people in a team. I was the driver of my team. I had a gunner. His last name was Thompson. And I had a team leader. His last name was Preer. Um, great guys who we got along with really well. Um, and then you have a squad of three teams plus a squad leader. 
and then you have a platoon of three to four squads, and then a battalion, and then a brigade. Our company was primarily from Wisconsin and the Madison and Milwaukee areas. My platoon was almost all Madisonians. So we were at Fort McCoy from March 15th until May 9th. And the things that we did at Fort McCoy were not applicable to the Vietnam or to the Iraq War. They were applicable to the Vietnam War. We would literally go through the woods as quiet as we could using arm and hand signals and we were flanking our enemies where we knew where they were. And then we got to Iraq. We were riding in loud Humvees in an urban environment and we had no idea who was shooting at us from behind the door or the window or blowing up the roadside bomb. So you can imagine that what we did at Fort McCoy did not translate over to Iraq. We were there for a month and a half because I don't think they really knew what they wanted to do with us. In fact, we didn't invade Iraq until March 19th. So we were already put on active duty before the, or before the invasion occurred. And we listened to a radio to find out if we were indeed going to invade Iraq or not. So we didn't have any privileged information even though we were in the military. Nor did we have a TV. Um, so when we were at Fort McCoy, the other thing that we did was we got tons and tons of vaccinations. And this is Courtney Fad a week after her smallpox shot. So you can still see it's, it festering there. Um, and we walked down a gauntlet of shots. So we got um, smallpox vaccination, anthrax, hep B, flu shot, penicillin, a whole bunch of other stuff I don't remember. <laughs> and then we were at Kuwait for a month and a half, um, May 9th to June 26th. We were known as the black sheep because we were a little unorthodox and did things a little bit differently. I'm standing right here in this picture, and this is my lovely platoon. That's camo netting behind us. We put that up everywhere because it blocked a lot of the sun, but still let a breeze come through. It got up to 130, 140 degrees on a regular basis. So I always ask the students, what's the lowest setting on your oven? <laughs> We were pretty darn close to that. It's so hot that candle wax is constantly in liquid form. I, it, it never hardens. The, so I grabbed a bottle of water that had been sitting out in the sun all day, and I was going to cut a girl's hair. I don't know why, but they all trusted me to cut their hair. So I was pouring the water on her head, and it gave her first degree burns and made her whole head pure red from the heat. The, if we got some care packages, and some of those care packages included microwave popcorn. But that butter melted before it got to us, so all of the stuff in our boxes were filled with butter, <laughs> covered in butter, even the books and everything else. And the binding, this is kind of convenient, the binding, the glue that binds the pages in, disintegrates in the heat. So we'd be reading novels outside, the wind would pick up, and our pages would just flutter away. <laughs> and obviously, you're sweating nonstop. We didn't have laundry services when we got to Kuwait. Um, it was a very barren desert fob for an operating base. And we would wear our uniforms for three days straight and then put our other ones on and hand wash the one that we just wore. So you can imagine after three days of sweat and dust and grossness, they almost stood up all by themselves. Oops. All right, so by the time our Humvees finally arrived, they got caught in a few tropical storms, and the first ship they got put on, it started to sink. So we finally got our Humvees about a month and a half after we got to Kuwait, and we then mounted up and drove for 14 hours for two days to get to Baghdad, Iraq from Kuwait. And I was the driver of the Humvee. I couldn't just say, all right, I'm tired, somebody take over, or I have to go to the bathroom, can we pull over at a gas station? So that's where the title of the book comes from. Um, I had to learn how to pee and drive at the same time because they're not going to stop a 53 vehicle convoy because Laura Colbert has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so I used a funnel, a 99 cent funnel that I bought from Fleet Farm, Farm and Fleet in Madison. And I stuck it in and grabbed, put a, put a um, water bottle on the other end and I pressed the gas because we had no cruise control in the Humvee and kept on steering and did, did my job. <laughs> And then I handed my water bottle to my team leader, and he threw it out the window. <laughs> All right. So while I was in Iraq, in Baghdad, Iraq, 
we lived along the Tigris River. I had a mile-long running route on this beautiful river. These were our different jobs that we had while we were there. So we started in the Iraqi police stations. Um, I was a lowly specialist during the deployment, so my job was to primarily sit at one of the six-ish fighting positions and wait to get attacked. And I sat and I sat for 12 and a half hour shifts in the beating hot sun. We weren't allowed to listen to music. We d weren't allowed to read books. There was no such thing as smartphones. <laughs> and iPods just started coming out. Um, we didn't have anybody to sit with us. So I would try and work on my Spanish from high school. I wrote, like, kept track of what color cars drove past, or I would write favorite boy names and favorite girl names and anything else that came to mind just to make the time go by because it was so arduous to just sit and do nothing. Um, sometimes I was lucky enough to train the Iraqi police officers. We taught them how to use Glocks. We taught them how to search people. We taught them how to treat prisoners. We taught them how to not sleep during their 24-hour shift. And um, then we went on foot patrols with them. So. You'll see in a few slides, I, we wear about 70 pounds of gear while we're there. Anywhere between 50 and 70, depending on how, how much your weapon weighs. And then, when we went on foot patrols, we'd have to put on a 60-pound giant metal radio for communications and march through the city. And it's not just walking around, chit-chatting. It's these kids globbing onto you trying to touch your gear, and you're hoping and praying they don't walk away with one of your ammo cases or your pistol or <laughs> do something that's very dangerous, right? So it was this constant on, on all the time as you're walking through the city. And then we went on foot patrols with the Iraqi police officers, so we drove through the city, and at the time we started this job, that's when roadside bombs, IEDs, improvised explosive devices, that's when they started to really become a thing. So as I'm driving, I am not only watching out for the horse-drawn carts and for the people and for the people driving down the wrong side of the street and for all of the craziness that is Iraq with six million people and very little laws, but I'm also looking over, out for the piece of garbage on the road. Is that a hidden ID? The, the, the rubble that's, that's unearthed, is that somebody that just buried an IED? So you're looking and scanning the entire eight-hour shift of driving, I don't think I've ever felt eyeball fatigue until that moment. <laughs> and then we did gate guard, which was actually one of the easiest and most entertaining jobs. We lived within the green zone, which is already a fortified area. So by the time they come to our compound, it's their second checkpoint that they're coming through. So we search the Iraqis, we search their vehicles, we check American IDs. Um, but for the most part, it was pretty easy because they've already been through a checkpoint. So I played a lot of stick and rock baseball and shot a flare up once in a while for fun, you know, flirted with the infantry that drove past. Um, and then we did brigade escort. <clears throat> so remember on that echelon of the police, how the police goes, brigade is the highest level. So we were escorting around colonels and majors and, and some higher ranking personnel throughout Baghdad. And then we did CPA escort. So that stands for Coalition Provisional Authority. Um, have, have you all heard of coalition forces? So that's like the allies. Um, so we actually were really close with the Australian UN ambassador. In fact, one of, their, one of their Australian security guards proposed to a girl in my squad. They didn't make it past six months, but hey. And then, um, and then we escorted around the diplomat in charge of Iraq. So at one point, I had or $526,000 in $100 bills in my Humvee. <laughs> I have a picture with it. And then, <laughs> and, then, um, and then we went back to the Iraqi police stations at the end of our deployment. <clears throat> so um, I was in the green zone in Baghdad. So that black circle, that's, that's kind of where the green zone lies. And then the reason why Ramadi on the far left, or the west, is circled and highlighted is because that's where my older brother was deployed. So in September of 03, he showed up over there in an infantry unit um, and worked on what is known as the Triangle of Death, I think is it called, and that includes Ramadi, Fallujah, and Baghdad. So he worked in this area and could write his own book based on the things that he went through.
Can you hear me? All right. And that, the irrigation system, we used as our shower. So there was no hot or cold. It was whatever the ground temp was that day. And to add insult to injury, the American helicopter pilots soon found out that there were women showering without roofs over their heads. So they decided to take detours through our compound and fly really low to see what they could see. They saw some birds from me. <laughs> and, well, I have this one right here. And then, um, and then the pool up on the top left, for about a month and a half, it had some dead birds and algae in it, but after a while, we, we hired an Iraqi to clean it out for us and we could actually um, swim. And that was one of the biggest morale boosters during our deployment, was to just jump in that pool after a long day and relax. All right. That's fine. Yeah. All right. So on the top left, I look very happy, because I am, because after two months of trying to sleep in 130 degree temperatures, we got to move into the basement and had air conditioning and a working toilet and a, a hot and cold shower that we could use. So, um, so I was really happy about that. But then the rats started showing up, so there's always that. <laughs> So this is El Shab, our home away from home. This is where we worked for the first three months of our deployment, tw or 12 and a half hour shifts almost every single day, minus a day off once a month, twice a month, if that. <clears throat> Here are some of our lovely police officers. So we have, um, as mentioned, 24 hour shift police officers sleeping on the roof. And when I asked them, why don't you go out and do your job? Why do you sleep at night? They're set, they said, because it's too dangerous. And I said, okay, who's supposed to be keeping the city safe? And they said, we are. And I said, okay. So you understand the conundrum, right? And it didn't persuade them. And we would walk around kind of loud and stomp around by them, but that didn't also persuade them to wake up. So they were pretty stubborn, and any flat surface they found, they decided to sleep. The guy on the top left, um, he's a civilian. He was injured. He needed a Band-Aid. I helped him out. But we often had uh, a lot of civilians come to the police station thinking Americans were, could heal all and do all. So we had a pretty drunk Iraqi come up with a broken humerus bone, and he was moving it around under his skin, showing us that he broke his bone. And there were a few car accidents with people that were just bloody and, and unconscious, and they'd carry them right up to the police station hoping that we could help them, and we would point to the hospital and say, take them to the hospital. Bottom left, you can just see some of the, the really great um, police officers. You know, after two and a half months, three months of being there, we created some pretty, pretty substantial relationships with these guys. This is Ra'ad. He was like the father of the police station. We called that guy Hollywood because he was good with the ladies. <laughs> Not us, just the Iraqis. And then this is Adnan, one of my favorite translators. He's Kurdish. We often had um, intellectual conversations about how, um, in his opinion, women were not as good as men. And he would give me educational material from the 1950s to read. And unfortunately, I did not have access to the internet, to the internet while I was there as much as I wanted. So I couldn't provide him with more up-to-date information. Um, but we, I must have um, done something right because he wrote me a love note in this little Barbie book with a locket and a key. So um, I'll leave it over there, and you can <laughs> read it if you want to. Um, <clears throat> All right, so this is our daily routine. This top picture here, that's me um, training the Iraqi police officers on, Glock, on the Glock, which is the pistol that we issued to the Iraqi police officers. And then that's my platoon sergeant, Sergeant Reynolds. His name is changed in the book. Um, we woke up at 4.30. We left the base at 5.15. My job was to check the vehicle to make sure it was in working order because it would be on me if we broke down outside of the of our of our um, compound so i need to make sure that didn't happen believe it or not i had to refill the battery fluid with water every day in that heat and then um, we would drive 45 minutes to get to the police station once again sit there for 12 and a half hours drive 45 minutes home eat at 7 45 and then free time at 8, 8 p.m oh wait i have to clean my weapons i have to refill the vehicle i have to make sure it's prepped and ready to go for the next day and i really tried to write back every single person who wrote to me in iraq so i spent a lot of time writing letters here are some pictures of some of the beautiful children um, I, I'm fine with this. It's fine. It's going to just take too long. So the guy in the middle in the yellow shirt, he's wearing a Michigan t-shirt. We saw bucks, badgers, 
brewers, packers, embroidered Wisconsin sweatshirts, a guy in high school wearing a hot pink sweatshirt that says, world's best grandma, and another guy wearing a shirt that says, I'm not sassy, I'm a redhead. <laughs> and, and, and my favorite, and probably most inappropriate, that's Miss Bitch to you <laughs> on a shirt that a guy was wearing. So, um, so always entertaining to see what they were wearing. Um, the kids up on the top right, they were super sweet, and they were at a very, very um, broken down police station. And every time they came up to us, they were covered in black flies, just all over. And, and, and this poor little guy, you can actually see the scab, actually in both of them, you can see the scabs all over their faces. So I tried to give them like food and water whenever I could. One of the problems with the kids, though, is that they flock towards us, like I said. And what happens when kids are around and we get attacked? Right? That's the last thing you want to happen, but they were so curious and so needy that we just we tried to appease them. Um, I did talk about, though, how sometimes they were just obnoxious and were doing it on purpose. <clears throat> so this is a really flattering picture of me with all of my gear. <laughs> this is where my night vision goggle um, goes right here, and I'm actually wearing them in the picture. This is my pistol holder right here. I'm holding on to a 12-pound automatic machine gun with six pounds of ammo right here, and then this is um, three pounds of ammo in each container for my M16. I have an eight-pound Kevlar on, two pounds night vision goggles, 20-pound vest with a 10-pound plate in front and a 10-pound plate in back. So by the time all is said, you're talking about 70 pounds of gear in full uniform in 130-degree heat. Piece of cake. <laughs> All right, so in the green zone, Saddam Hussein had a, a palace. He had many palaces, but this particular palace was, um, was where our coalition forces lived and worked. And it was actually the US Embassy towards the end of our deployment for a brief moment in time. There were gold-plated doors that were you know, um, protected with glass. There was marble everywhere. And I am sitting in his throne which is also gold-plated, in his mosque. And look at the beautiful mural behind me. It is rockets flying through the air in his place of worship. So if you had any question about Saddam Hussein's <laughs> mental health, that might, be, might, might help. <laughs> so I have to tell you the story. I, um, I, you know, we went through a lot with going to the bathroom. It was, first, before we got toilets, it was you're going behind bushes, or you're using the funnel, or you're burning a box with stuff in it, right? And I went to the bathroom once in this, in this beautiful palace. And I walk out, and, and I'm waiting for my friend to finish up. And this very fancy woman who works for the coalition forces walked in, and I was like, the first stall is open because they're solid doors, and you can't always tell. I was trying to be nice. She goes, ugh, everybody uses that stall. I don't use the... I'm like, I'm sorry, do you want to want to go do what I just did for the last three months? <laughs> and I didn't mention that there's a full-time person that works in the bathrooms to clean them after every use. <laughs> so this is Courtney Fad, the same one that had the smallpox shot. Um, everyone has their days, and I don't know why, I don't know how I took this picture, but I feel like it's a perfect segue into what I'm about to talk to, to talk about. Behind her is my bazooka. It's not the real name, but that's what I call it now. Um, we took those out to the range right before we went home to shoot them off, and almost all of them were duds. About two or three out of the ten actually worked, so we're lucky we didn't need them in combat. On October 27th of 2003, El Shab was hit with a massive car bomb. It killed 21 people almost all of whom were civilians, and injured over 100 people. It actually blew out windows in a four-block radius. So imagine that going off here and affecting the Danes' home. This is a soldier standing right here. Can we see him? <clears throat> and then obviously you can see the difference there. This hole had been filled with water because of a water main break. So. On that previous slide, I told you that we get to the police station within 45 minutes. On this particular day, I was the lead driver of the convoy, which I typically was while deployed. I had an amazing team leader who was, who was just, he was, he was the best leader you can possibly imagine. So we trusted him, he trusted me, we were the lead, lead Humvee in the convoy. He's like, 
drive over that sidewalk, drive down the wrong side of the street, hit that median, go through that intersection. I got to the police station in 25 minutes compared to 45. I think I scraped a few vehicles, but nothing bad. Um, <clears throat> and when we got there, it was like parting the Red Sea of people. There were, we estimated 4,000 people already there gaping at this giant destruction. And there was still dust settling in the sky. And as you approached, it was like you were entering into a different place. It was unrecognizable as things unfolded before us. My, t my gunner was up on the turret telling people to go away. My gunner, or my, my team leader was, was, had his gun out the window and he's telling people to go away and I'm honking my Corolla-sized horn as best as I can on that Humvee and I'm trying to get people to go away. <clears throat> and when we got there, the destruction again was devastational. We heard on the radio, go to Al Shab, they just got hit with an RPG. This is not an RPG. So our first job was to push the crowd away from the police station because we were still getting threats of more attacks. And the last thing we wanted was a giant attack that kills thousands of people instead of just 21. So I took that Constantino, concertina wire, that circular razor sharp wire that surrounds prisons, and I held onto it with my gloves, and I was standing right here, and I was walking that crowd inch by inch backward away from the kill zone, away from ground zero. And then I turned around and I saw fathers carrying their dead, charred, and burned babies out of the rubble. And that was one of the hardest things that I had ever, ever seen while I was there because they never would have died had we not been in that country, had we not been at that police station. You know, I wrote a letter to the editor when we first got deployed about, we're doing awesome things. I am, we're making change. We're I can see things happening, we're creating, we're creating great relationships, we're, we're getting along, the people are cheering us on. And within six months, we started getting rocks thrown at us, we started getting the middle finger, we started hearing bad America, we started getting this. And so you start to wonder, what, what's working? What's working? When I got home, I read in the newspaper day after day of all of our police, in, police stations we worked in getting bombed and destroyed. So you hope and pray that you made a difference, but you don't know anymore. <clears throat> this is the side of the police station. You could, it's missing a wall. And then this was the parking lot wall that went all the way around. I found th this picture on yahoo.com the next day. So there was actually a photographer sitting on the rooftop across the street. And when I first saw him, sitting there I was like that looks like a gun put my finger on the trigger flip my weapon to fire and I was about ready to get him in my sights and then I realized it was a camera so found it on yahoo.com this is a before and after across the street this very well could have been some of the kids that I saw getting dragged out of the building this is panned over. So this used to be a two-story building here. We watched these families sleep and eat and spend family time together out on their decks. These were cars that are completely destroyed and unrecognizable. This is a picture from outside looking into the Iraqi police offices, office and then our military police office was the next room down. This is looking from the inside out of our MP office and the IP office. We actually had a squad of soldiers there from 3rd Platoon checking on the police station when the explosion happened. They were not parked where they were supposed to be parked. They were not in the MP office like they were supposed to be, but those two things saved their lives. The lieutenant who was inside, he had to get staples put in his head and he had a severed ear that they reattached. Um, everybody else had you know, some minor concussions and some um, bruising and some shrapnel wounds and that's the extent of the damage. <clears throat> There were 60 prisoners that escaped that day. This cell door was on the opposite side of the police station from where the explosion occurred. And you can see shrapnel cut through that wall or cut through the door and you can see clothes and blood still scattered about. This is upstairs. The whole upstairs was just annihilated. Doors on the floor, blood on the walls, blood on the doors, 
more destruction. As I walked in the police station, there was a lone hand lying on the ground all by itself. This is that concertina wire I was talking about. This is the crowd I was talking about. Those are the missing windows I was talking about. And this is the next day. <clears throat> so I often get asked, what do you do to let loose and to get rid of all that stress and that anxiety? Well, this particular night, we were getting hit really hard with mortars. Mortars um, increasingly got worse and worse as we were there. Rockets, mortars, um, RPGs, they were flying them over our compound wall as often as they could. And so this day, or this night, we were told to put on our gear. And I was already lying in bed, I was reading a book, and when you put on that vest, there's a curved plate in there. So you can't really lay down with that plate digging into your back because it hurts so bad. So somebody put on some dance music, and we started dancing and clanging around as best we could with all of our gear on, and then we got the all clear, and we just kept on dancing. <laughs> and there are way more pictures. <laughs> but that's me right there. Um, and that's how we let, go, let loose. We had bongo drums we played on the roof. We just talked till, till the night was, was almost over. We did everything we could to be together as sisters and brothers at war to get over that complete and constant fear. So um, Christmas Day um, was... You know, it wasn't so bad. My amazing parents, who are seated right over there, um, sent over this blow-up snowman, and they sent over this Christmas tree and decorations, and so on Christmas Day, we got that Christmas tree off my shelf. We stuck it in the middle of the room. We all sat around it. We put our presents underneath it. We turned on Destiny's Child's Christmas CD, because that's the only one we had. <laughs> we, we drank a non-alcoholic bottle of wine, and watched National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, and that was, that was it. That's all we needed was each other and that experience. And it just so happened that we had a photojournalist from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel embedded in our, in our unit during Christmas, and we're eight hours ahead in Baghdad, so by the time, eight hours, or by the time Christmas rolled around here in Wapaka, my parents got the newspaper, and I was on cover on the on the cover in color wearing their Christmas present. <laughs> so I'll pass that around and you guys can look at that. Um, later that day, I called home from the satellite, one of the two satellite phones, <clears throat> and I had to go to this, the tactical operations center. And as I'm sitting there talking to my parents and wishing them a Merry Christmas, we started getting hit with mortars pretty, pretty close. And so I swore and I said holy s I gotta go and I said love you bye and hung up the phone and ran for cover and with mortars you never know if they're gonna hit you once they start landing because they they adjust the mortar tubes and they walk them into you so it's kind of a crapshoot if you run or if you stay or where you run or if you stay so um, I ran to the basement I felt horrible that I did that to my parents on Christmas Day like the guilt was to the max this whole time, I'm kind of like, it's not a big deal. It's not so bad here. We're not really that much in danger. And then they heard it themselves. So I decided to call them back. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like play down what just happened, right? It's, they weren't that close. I misinterpreted where they were landing, whatever I could say. So I called them back. And mortars landed even closer. And I really thought I was going to die. I said, holy effing S, <laughs> I got to go. Um, I will email you when I get to the basement, because I'm not calling back, I'm sorry. So I did that, and, and then I, that was what I left my parents with on Christmas, so I'm sorry. But the next day, my older brother came to visit. <laughs> he, uh, he's, like I said, was in Ramadi. He still claims he hitchhiked, which I don't think is, near, is possible in a war zone. Um, he likes to tell fish tales. But um, he came and he visited for six days. We watched a lot of ESPN. We went to go visit Ude and Kuse's lions that were like two compounds down. They oftentimes urinated on people, so we kept our a wide berth. Um, and we, yeah, we just hung out. He actually came on a mission with me only one time for one day because if we were to get hurt at the same time, that would be horrible. So he stayed back while I did missions for the most part. All right. <clears throat> this is my fifth presentation today, so I did some at the middle school. <clears throat> when I say extension hell, I literally meant we thought we were in hell because of the amount of times we got extended. 
the first, when we first got deployed, they said, six months tops, no problem, you'll be home by September. You might even be able to go back to school right away. Well, September came and went, as you know. And then they said, no major holidays, you'll be home before Thanksgiving. Well, as you know, Christmas came and went. And then they said before Christmas, but again, as you know, Christmas came and went. And then they said January 29th, they took that away. Then they said one year on active duty, which meant we'd be home by March 15th. That came and went. And then they said one year with boots on the ground. We're like, okay. We didn't really believe them because after all of those times, it's hard to have faith in anybody's word. But we were optimistic. We started cleaning Humvees. We started sending stuff home. People were actually done with missions. They, they, they would sit at the compound while my platoon still did the escort missions for the diplomats. <clears throat> and they were cleaning and sending things home. And it was actually coming to fruition. One of those nights, our platoon sergeant came into our room. I was watching Finding Nemo. And he said, get your gear on. There are insurgents attacking the police stations in Baghdad. OK, it's 10.30 at night. I'll get my gear on. I'll drive my non-power um, steering up armor Humvee all the way to El Shab, <laughs> park it, get out, sit there for five hours, get back in the Humvee, drive back home, get a few hours of sleep, and get up and do escort missions. Then while we were on those escort missions, they decided 96-hour operations in the police station. Four days straight. Four days, 100% police station coverage. So my platoon would go to our escort mission, go straight to Automia's police station, go home for a few hours of sleep, go to our escort mission, go to Automia police station, go home and get a few hours of sleep. On the second night, we were driving home at 2 a.m., and when you're in an up-armor Humvee, gunshots sound like clapping or like popcorn popping. And I started to hear popcorn. And all of a sudden, in my rearview mirror, I saw all the gunners do this. And I said to my team leader, we're getting shot at. He's like, gun it. So I gunned it all the way into the green zone. And as I, I'm gunning it, a IED went off behind our Humvees. We get in the green zone. We slam on the brakes. We come out. We assess each other. We assess our vehicles. And everything is unscathed. We were so fortunate. The next night, we're coming home at 2 a.m. We took a different route because in a war zone, you don't ever take the same route twice. Except this time, over the radio, a lieutenant gets on the radio, and he's incoherently screaming about blood and ears and mouth and breathing and Gunner and Whitmer, and, and the, the talk has to tell him to slow down. And he finally gets out that they took that same route home that we took the night before. And Michelle Whitmer, who's 20 years old, was a gunner, and she got shot through the shoulder, through the lung, into the heart. And we heard her, her die over the radio. So the next day, we had a, uh, we had a memorial service for Michelle. She was the first female in the history of the National Guard to die in a combat-related incident. It was all over the news. This letter she sent to her sister, her twin sister, who, by the way, was a medic in Baghdad. Her older sister was a military police officer in a different platoon in our company. She wrote this to her twin sister. It was in Glamour magazine about a year after we got home. And it says, hey, sweetie bear, Life here has been very crazy the last week or so. About five days ago, our platoon sergeant starts running into our room saying the Baghdad police stations are overrun and there are riots all over the city. In the meantime, we're getting attacked almost nightly with RPGs, mortars, and small arms fire. Rachel's station in Atomia, that's again where I was, got the worst of it. I was really afraid for her charity. Please pray for us. This is some scary shit. Hopefully by next week, this will all be over. Love you forever. Later that day, Whitmer was killed when a convoy was attacked. Her sisters are now in the U.S. with her parents. And her sisters had to fight tooth and nail to stay home because the military wanted them both to come back. We had a memorial service for her. Um, big pipes and amazing grace, taps, 21 gun salute, the whole nine yards. Um, we would go up to her Kevlar and her ID tags, and we'd say goodbye and salute her for her service. And then the, um, the Army National Guard headquarters in Wisconsin put a bust, a bronze bust of her in their, in their um, place. 
Two days later, after Michelle died, was Easter Sunday. What do I do on holidays? I call my parents. So I was talking to my parents on the phone. Yes, we had just been through a heck of a lot with Michelle's death, but there was still hope of going home. I had a tickets to DC planned. Um, I had a flight out to New York City planned. There were weddings planned. We were talking about watching the birds and drinking coffee on their deck. And just, you know, generally comforting each other over Michelle's death. Three hours later, we get ordered back to the compound and sat down in our theater, which I forgot to mention existed. And our platoon leader says we're extended for four more months. So we had to move to tents in southern Baghdad. We had to go back to the Iraqi police stations and we had to cancel everything that was planned for the next four months. It was beyond devastating, and this email, I think, depicts my feelings better than I can in this time. Another week of missing home more than I could say. It's been a rough one. A lot of emotions, and not many of them good. This place is taking a toll on me. My hope and morale have been drained from my system. Now I'm just a pile of skin and bones that does what I'm told. It's hard to even think for myself anymore. I just don't care. I don't care when mortars hit. I don't care when an ID goes off. I'm numb. That's why they need to get us out of here. We have nothing left mentally or physically. It is completely inhumane what they have done to us. We are tortured souls. And that's how I felt. I was like, I just want to get out of here. I don't want to die. I certainly didn't want to commit suicide, but heck yeah, you can shoot me. Like, do whatever to get me out of here. I didn't care if I didn't have a limb, if I couldn't walk, if I couldn't ride, if I couldn't play volleyball. I didn't see any other way to get home beyond injury at that point because I didn't, I didn't think it was ever going to happen. So, like I said, we moved down into tents and we started working in Iskandaria and Musayab and started going into these decrepit, one light bulb, no window, dirt floor police stations to help them start from scratch. And because we were driving so much, we were attacked often by IEDs. And this particular IED was the most devastational one. It was two Humvees behind my own. I thought my gunner had slammed his ammo case on the Humvee roof, and I was like, don't do that. And as I was saying that, a Humvee flew past me and slammed into this garage. So in the process, the team leader, who was sitting here, noticed they were heading to the garage and there was no driver, so he jumped out of the Humvee on his own. The driver was sucked out of the Humvee. So the, the blast hit the Humvee and then sucked her out and she was bruised internally and externally down the entire left side of her body. When she walked up to us, she was like a zombie covered in dust. And the passenger behind her was knocked unconscious with big piece of shrapnel sticking out of his leg and the gunner, who was one of my best girlfriends, who has brought the most humor to my life, they couldn't find. And I was standing there, like, pulling security, telling me, you cannot tell me you cannot find Garcia. This is not okay. I will not make it. They ended up finding her, tucked in the fetal position, knocked unconscious, bleeding profusely in the back of the Humvee. She, they thought she had two compound fractures in her arms, but it was just two pieces of metal jutting out. And I just saw her in September, and she said, Laura, look, I can do this with my arm, and that's all I can rotate it. She still has shrapnel in her arm. So this is Carly. You can see all of her shrapnel wounds on her face and her arm, and then look at the top of her saw. It is missing two inches. So a piece of metal just sheared that right off. All right, July 11th, Woo -wee! we finally got the okay to go home. <laughs> so we uh, got ready for our two-day uh, two drive. Um, we were already covered in sweat, as you can see, and started driving south. And this was, this is where I lost the most weight in my entire life. <laughs> it was like 100 pounds were lifted off of me. The stress, the anxiety, the wonderment, is that an IED? Is that person going to kill me? Is that piece of garbage going to blow up in my face? It was over. This was the ditch between Iraq and Kuwait. So when we crossed that, I didn't realize how much anxiety and stress and, and, and crushing weight that I had, that I was holding on to until that, that fateful moment. So 
this is from the airplane window when we landed in Volk, Volk Field, Wisconsin, which is over by, um, well, it's on the west side of Wisconsin. Those are our family and friends holding up signs and posters. And as soon as that, as soon as that airplane door opened, you could hear them screaming and chanting, and it was so wonderful. The grass was so much greener than I remember, and the sky was so blue. <laughs> in Iraq, everything is just covered in a light layer of dust. Um, and then when they opened up the, the doors, too, that smell of vegetation was so powerful. I felt like I was in a Tide commercial. <laughs> and the UW band was playing, and we had the governor shake our hands, and a whole bunch of other bigwigs in the military, and that truck. I could finally get rid of my weapons for the first time in 16 months. I didn't have to say, hey, Owen, can you watch my weapons? I want to go for a run. You'd be going with me, right, Owen? <laughs> I didn't have to memorize a serial number. I didn't have to clean them every day. I could hand over these chunks of metal that had become my babies. And then my parents. <laughs> so before I left, excuse me a second, because this story gets me almost every time. Before I left, my dad sat me down in the sunroom. And he said, here, Laura, here's, here's a $2 bill. I found this in your, my, grand, my, my dad's wallet when he died. It's his lucky $2 bill, and I want you to take it. So every day at war, I made sure that that $2 bill was tucked into my front pocket. And when I got home, the first thing I did was I handed him that $2 bill, and I said, I made it. <laughs> and man, he wouldn't stop staring at me. <laughs> so, so I finally said, Dad, you won't stop staring at me. And he said, but Laura, you're home, and you're my daughter, and you're finally home. And, um, and that touch, that physical, comforting, loving touch, it was so foreign to me after 16 months of being at war. It almost felt wrong. Well, two months later, my older brother got home. And so we were together as a family for the first time in two years. And so we all drove down to Fort Riley to, to welcome him home. And that's us. Um, my twin brother, who I'm also extremely proud of, he's a detective in the Madison Police Department. And um, crazy story, even though I went to war, we graduated four hours apart from college. I became a head principal of the school the same day he became the detective in the Madison Police Department. So we're living very interesting lives. He was a teacher, now he's a police officer. I was a police officer and then a teacher. <laughs> um, so that's the end of my time at war and the beginning of the rest of my life. And this is Carly, the one that was hit with the IED. So, um, so yeah, I wrote a book, uh, as mentioned. You might be here for that. I don't know. Um, I wanted to um, this to be the cover. I wanted a, just a blue funnel and how to piece standing up super provocative. What's it about? But my editor did not agree. So that's a picture of me. <laughs> um, life is a veteran and your lesson for today. The return from the killing fields is more than a debriefing. It is a slow ascent from hell. So pause for a second. And let me just tell you, every time I dreamt about home, it was this heavenly facade. I could get in my car, I could drive wherever I wanted, I could wear what I wanted, I could hang out with who I wanted, I could do whatever I wanted. But when I got home, it sucked. I was so depressed and down. And I would look at my photo albums, and I said to the students today, yeah, we still had photo albums, <laughs> from, from my junior or my sophomore year of college, and I would be like, I'm never going to be able to smile like that again. I'm never going to be that happy or that innocent. So there was a time when I could feel un unadulterated happiness, a time when my life was innocent and carefree. I was desecrated by the horrendousness of war. A piece of me was left behind somewhere in desolate Iraq. Some days that piece feels like it's a tiny hole in my heart. Other days it feels like it sucks me in whole, leaving me with nothing but the darkness to stare at and relish in. I was no longer innocent or happy. Through time, this hole has become manageable, and that happiness I felt before the killing fields is slowly finding its way back into my being. I am becoming the person I once was, but it's been a difficult journey. From now on, take a second to consider the veteran. The person who gave everything to serve their country, only to return home to feel ostracized, changed beyond recognition of their new internal war. A sound, sight, or smell can trigger intrusive thoughts, flashbacks, and the pure agony. The war a veteran faces is not over once a soldier steps on American soil. It will always be there lingering. 
Personally, it's the sound of thunder, fireworks, a door slamming, a gunshot, a gunshot, the smell of a specific hand soap, the full moon. In August, I watched the entire lunar cycle as I was on the night shift in Elshop. And I would look at that moon and I would think, this is the same moon my parents just saw and that they'll see again in a short few hours. I am not on a foreign planet. We can share this moon together. And so when I got home one night, I was walking home from the bars and I saw the full moon and it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I just started bawling. A piece of garbage on the road here in Wapaka. <laughs> I was on uh, just one of the back roads and there was a piece of garbage. I actually got into the other lane thinking I was in a Humvee to avoid the garbage and there was a car coming at me and I was like, Phil, get out of my way, I'm in a Humvee. Until split second I realized I wasn't and I got back into my lane but I almost had a head-on collision because of that piece of garbage. A song on the radio, the list can go on and on. Triggers are elusive yet real. Thank God a cop never saw me go through lights in Madison because I ran them all the time. Uh, veterans are everywhere and I are affected differently. Some veterans get angry, some, veter some veterans drink, some veterans don't talk, some talk too much, <laughs> some, some shut down. I mean, you just never know. For me, I cry. I cry, obviously. But please be cognizant of them always. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my presentation. <laughs> Thank you.